Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is Dr. Nick, who has an interesting and scary story about using a mechanical device, allegedly, in a casino. We'll be talking to Dr. Nick in a few minutes. Before we talk to him, we have three listener questions from our mailbag that we're going to answer. Keep sending them to gamblingwithanedge at gmail.com. The first question is a follow-up to one we tried to answer on our last show. Someone wanted to know the value of getting a player's card, and we weren't sure if he was talking about using it for video poker or perhaps deciding whether to play blackjack with or without giving up his ID. Turns out he wanted to know the basics of using it in video poker. So that's what we're going to talk about. There's a number of factors here. First, casinos give players stuff of value and you need a player's card to get it. Some very useful things like cash back, cash in the mail, free room and board. They also give you some worthless crap, such as a free logo baseball hat or four matching coffee cups that matching nothing else in your house. And uh, you hang out at casinos playing video poker enough and you'll get a garage full of this stuff. Uh, try to give it away or burn it or something. But you got, you'll have way too much. But you do, you're you not forced to pick it up. But some of the stuff they give you is cool. Now, the Players Club will often tell you how much... Uh, you get like such as it might take five dollars to earn a point at video poker and uh, two dollars to earn a point at, at slots and 200 points will get you dollar fifty in cash back or free play whatever there's a million ways to phrase this every casino is a little bit different and if you're good at simple algebra it's easy to figure out for video poker what we had above was worth 0.15 percent if you're not good at simple algebra video poker dot I'm sorry, Video Poker for Winners uh, has a slot club calculator that will help you on this. For the cash in the mail, sometimes you just need to play and find out what they send you. Uh, Keep good records of how much you played and how much you won or lost, and eventually you'll be able to figure out whether this is worth 0.1, 0.2, 0.3, or or whether as you get $100 a month no matter how much you play. So there's different ways to do this. Often players' card members get bonuses that others don't. Point multipliers are sometimes only good to players card holders. Uh, South Point, on the promotion we've been talking about all month, just ending in August, there's a weekend email blast where if you have a a card and they have your email address, they send you a um, free play on the weekends. They're often tier levels, T-I-E-R, tier levels, uh, where the higher tiers get you valuable stuff. Sometimes the tiers get you more cash back, sometimes free cruises, sometimes shorter lines at the buffet, 50% or more off of meals and other extra goodies. Some of the things are not valuable at all. Some are very valuable. It's only limited by the marketing director's imagination, and they make mistakes. Once you get an approximate value for the sum of all these things, you add that to the game to see if it's worth playing. Uh, If you're playing 99 a half percent game like uh, nine six jacks or better you need a relatively small amount of slot club benefits to make the game profitable if you're playing nine six double double bonus which returns a bit less than 99 percent you need considerably more benefits to make the game playable so um, it's useful to befriend a player in the casino who plays the same games at about the same level as you do if it's much faster to learn the ins and outs of a slot club from somebody else knowledgeable rather than figuring it all out by yourself. There's more to it than we have time for today, but um, the preceding summary will at least get you started. All right, second question. For people who've been through it, I'm wondering if there's an optimal way of learning basic strategy at blackjack. Some of the rules make sense and I can get them to stick, like standing on 13 when a five is showing, looking for the dealer to bust. Others, like splitting twos or three versus seven, or doubling ten versus eight, but not a nine, uh, which is an interesting rule. I'm not sure why, uh, other th- um, other than the numbers must say so. So, Richard, can you help this guy out? Well, um, yeah, I, I remember when I was first learning, or a lot of times when people are first learning, they're 
looking to try to apply what they think is logic to why you make a particular play. And often you can't do that. So you have to just accept that the math is right. Now, how to learn it to make it easier for you to learn. People learn in different ways and I'm very visually oriented. So for me, it helped to look at the color coded basic strategy charts. Uh, which I thought were really good in Lawrence Revere's book, Playing Blackjack as a Business. And so you would notice the visual patterns of when the double downs changed or the pair splits or whatever. Now, if if you're actually interested in the numbers, um, Theory of Blackjack by Peter Griffin has charts that'll tell you, oh, if you split deuces against a seven your return is going to be this. And if you don't split the deuces against a seven, it's going to be that. And you will see that, you know, your return is lower if you don't split them. So you realize you should split them. So if you want the numbers, you can go to Theory of Blackjack. Or actually, um, Lawrence Revere's book also had uh, charts for that too, um, playing blackjack as a business. So yeah, just uh, you cannot be successful unless you get it through your head from the very beginning that the math is the math and you have to just trust that the math is correct and do what it tells you to do. There's a tool available today that I did not have access to when I was playing blackjack. Uh, was the Casino Verite, which is computer software that will correct you when you're wrong. That is the biggest reason I've gotten so good at video poker is I've had software that would tell me when I bang a dummy so I know how bad I am until I can get it down perfect. Now, the Casino Verite may have been out there, but I didn't have a, um, a PC until probably 94. So I don't know how long Casino Verite has been out there. But, yeah, and um, there, are, there are apps, too, for your phone now that will tell you when you're making an incorrect basic strategy play, too. So you, that... That'll help you learn. As you say, I agree. That that really helps in learning anything. So, All right. Third question. A player say he's, says he's a low-stakes blackjack player, and he's considering adding poker of no-limit Texas Hold'em. Now, if he plays with a 5% risk of ruin on both games, he wants to know if he can use the same bankroll for both. Is it right to assume his risk of ruin will not change? Will the variance be close to the same as just playing blackjack? Now, I'm not an expert at either game, but I do have something to say about this. And Dr. Nick raised his hand. So after I finish my piece, I'm going to call on him and he has something to say about it. For blackjack, given a set of rules, bet spread, penetration, you can figure out a risk of ruin. Uh, there's a fixed strategy, and assuming you play it perfectly, which is not a given, a lot of players don't play it perfectly, you can be clear about what you should do on every hand. In poker, it's much more difficult. At most games, the exact strategy is not even known, and even when it is known, others at the table play strategies that are wildly different from what they call game theory optimal. So, your risk of ruin depends on your skill level, but also the skill level of your opponent. In most cases, your exact opponents will frequently be changing. And it takes a while to get an estimate of their skill level compared to yours. And your estimates might be way off. And your opponents and you might have really good days and games, days that you're steaming and you're wild. So um, tomorrow you're going to have a different set of opponents. So it's possible you're never going to have enough information to accurately say that whether or not you have a 5% risk of ruin with any precision. So, Dr. Nick, your hand was up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I actually play blackjack, and I also have recently been involved in poker for about you know, about a year now. Um, first, I started out in a limit variety, and then I went to no limit hold'em. Uh, as in blackjack, the most important thing in poker is, Richard? Game, game selection, selection. <laughs> in stereo. And after that, it's seat selection. Uh, a Friday night or Saturday night at Harrah's or Flamingo when all the 
alcohol is flowing liberally among, you know, mid thirties people is going to be a better return. Um, any number of books. Uh, I know you have Ed Miller on a couple times and he, any, any, his books are great. Um, they give you a solid foundation, but yeah, game selection, game selection. But at the same time, you got to remember bad beat after bad beat. You can run terrible like in blackjack and an eight deck shoe. You can run terrible in poker for weeks and months at a time. Yeah, I, I would just say that um, he says he's a low-stakes blackjack player, but I don't know what that means. <laughs> if he means he's betting nickels up to f- 5 to 25, well, then, no, that's not. You probably don't have an adequate bankroll to play 1-2 no limit. But um, if you're, if low-stakes means you're betting green chips and maybe your top bet is $100, then, yes, if you are a winning player, then that bankroll should be more than enough to cover one, two, no limit. I would also say that generally the um, variance in one, two, no limit is much less than blackjack. Um, One, two, no limit is a very easy game to beat. And if you're not beating it consistently, you really need to look at your game. So, um, you know, there's not a lot of finesse and subtlety at the one, two level. So... Well, in a, in a, um, in a, for a $5 stakes player, I mean, I tend to go 1,000 units, so five grand of that. I think another five grand on top of that for a 1-2 game should be adequate. Yeah, I would think $5,000 for a 1-2 game. Yeah, I mean, if you're a winning player, I would think that would be plenty. If you're a smart player. Yeah. All right, so let's talk to our guest. Dr. Nick is a medical doctor. He has science degrees. He ran the MIT team, Blackjack team for a while, um, and he has a podcast that we're going to talk about later, and he's threatened to have me on it later in the year. So, uh, Dr. Nick, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Thank you, Bob and Richard. Now, in the middle of May of last year, 15 months ago, um, you had an experience at Green Valley Ranch, uh, which is a casino in Henderson, which is southeast of Las Vegas proper. So, Nick, what happened? Uh, Well, short version, Reader's Digest version, I was arrested for allegedly cheating and spent seven days in the Clark County Detention Center. Full room food and beverage, by the way. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, I, Those bologna uh, sandwiches. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, it looked like bologna. It smelt like bologna. I didn't taste it, so I wouldn't know if it was actually was bologna. You fasted for seven days? Not, yeah. I would trade my food trays uh, for the low sodium ones to some other uh, guests. And yes, that's an interesting word. Some, yep. Sometimes RFB uh, uh, honored guests. <laughs> yes, uh, sometimes they would have fresh fruit or bread. I would usually eat the bread and it's like some type of sugary water that they would give you. Okay, but let's talk about why okay. you got arrested. What? Well, I want to know if we met uh, Bubba. In, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> I did not meet anybody named Bubba. But um, long story short, uh, I do a lot of writing for various uh, magazines. Uh, Forbes magazine, Entrepreneur magazine, uh, Gambling Insider, um, and a part, and it's all orbits around the gaming industry. And mostly, what I talk about is you know how bad casinos do it wrong, uh, how wrong they get it. You know, as far as what type of things they're trying to get to the players. And as part of my proofs for this, I would always have what you would call a crowd counter, and I would always walk through casinos and you know click how many patrons were on the machines. And you divide that by how many number of total machines, and it would be what I call an occupancy rating at any given time. And I had this thing on my on my keychain. So, so I, I just want to. We've all seen these things. It's like the the guy, uh, the ticket taker. He clicks the little button, and it counts one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it goes up and up and up and up. Yeah. So one particular evening, I was uh, playing at Green Valley Ranch. I think it was down like seventeen or eighteen hundred dollars. Which is pretty standard for the levels that I play when when you do it, when you take a hit, and um, as I was getting up and leaving, uh, I went to the bathroom, washed my hands, and went to cash my chips out. And then I was walking towards the door, and then a series of five large security guards surrounded me, and they wanted to know what I had in my hand. I said, oh, "It was just the you know, my keys and a crowd counter that I use for for work." Oh, okay, well, we got to call gaming. All right. 
thinking nothing of it. I just sat there for about 25, 30 minutes, and then gaming came, and and then they said, well, we got to go downstairs, and then the security guards placed me placed me under arrest. Wait, the security uh, guards can't place you under arrest? They're not police. Exactly, point one. But they handcuffed me, and you know they they said uh, you know, you're being arrested for use of a uh, cheating device. I was like. Okay, all the time I'm thinking this has got to be some mistake. You know, I'm just, they're being they're punking me or something's going on. They're just trying to scare me. Maybe they knew my face or name from the old MIT blackjack teams or whatever. And um, so I was like, all right. So I go down. You know, they arrest me and they ask me, um, "You're being arrested for 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 cheating uh, at a at a game using a device." I was like, really? And, and, they, and they go, "How? Oh, we don't need to tell you that." Okay. No, wait, is gaming there at this point? Gaming is there. Okay. Yes. It come so quick. gaming so, can arrest you. They gaming can arrest officers. you, yes. Yeah, okay. So they, and I asked them, you know, am I being arrested? And they said, yes, for use of a cheating device. I said, can you tell me how? No. They don't have to tell you that. Go, okay. A little suspicious. So, you know, they, they locked me up and they says, would you like to make a statement at this time? And I looked at the gaming agent dead in the eye and I said, this will not end well for you. And at which point... I didn't say anything anymore. They put me in the car, and uh, I was booked at about 1 o'clock in the morning with a variety of colorful people down at Clark County Detention Center. And and then I was put in a tank for five, or for about 36 hours. And um, I was arraigned by the judge um, and asked me to plead guilty or not guilty. I'm absolutely not guilty. At this point, I had uh, ascertained an attorney. Uh, the original bail was set at like forty, forty-five, fifty thousand dollars or something, which is strange because some drug dealers don't even get that much. The judge kind of smirked a little bit and uh, got it down, knocked it down to ten, and then I knocked it down. The, the attorney got it down to five. So it's like, great, I'm an AP. I have five grand on me, no problem. Oh, you can't use your own money. <laughs> Why not? After, after I scratched my head, I was like, okay. So I filled out the paperwork to have it released, uh, my, my personal effects, to a bail bondsman so I could call a friend or family to come to, to post the bond. And the paperwork was conveniently lost. That takes three days. And so at which point I spend another – I fill out the paperwork again three days later because it they, they said we didn't get it. So I had to fill it out again, and that took another three days. And uh, at that point, they moved me to the North uh, Las Vegas Detention Center. You didn't have anybody in town you could call and say, come bail well, me out? All my all my contacts were in my phone. And a, one of the tragic things of today's environment, you know, with smartphones, I really don't memorize telephone numbers. You know what? Um, so this exact thing happened to James Grossheen. Exactly. They, they uh, J- conveniently J- lost his paperwork. He spent seven days, and he he said the exact same thing. He didn't know anybody's phone number, so after that, he deleted I, all contacts uh, from his phone, and he now memorizes well, I memori- everyone's yes, phone number. Yes, I memorize phone number. I've memorized uh, four or five people that I know, and yeah. yeah and James and I at the this year, uh, last year, and la- this year's Blackjack Ball had an ex- extensive conversation about this, and uh, and uh, James is quite a chess player, and I was uh, an Illinois State champion uh, my senior year in high school for chess. So I would play chess with the other – because a lot of them play chess to kind of keep their self occupied. They had a chess board? They have the... a chess board. Huh. Well, in, in, the, in, the, in the main jail area, not in the holding tank. Oh. So, you know, I was in the holding tank for only 36 hours and then, uh, you know, five and a half days after that. Um, if you beat them, would you get an extra bologna sandwich? Well, I'll tell you what. What I would do was uh, they were, you know, they were – terrible players but i would keep them close enough to keep them engaged so when they're they're, they're trying to fight me on the chessboard they're not trying to fight me you know in the you know in the yard or whatever you would call it so that's what i would do and um and i would prolong the chess games you know as long as i could until they made a blatantly obvious move that i had to checkmate them in three or four moves and then you know after that, uh, it's in jail. You know, it's it is what it is. Um, hours seem like days. Days seem like weeks. Um, but they do have a TV there, so it was you know it was halfway decent. Now I assume by the first day you had gotten a hold of Bob Nersessian. Or uh, first day I did get a hold of Bob Nersessian. Uh, Bob Nersessian does not take these types of cases. 
but it was he, a criminal. It case. was a criminal case, yeah. so we had to we had to beat the criminal case uh, first, which we did. Uh, two months later. Uh, Walsh and Friedman, uh, attorneys in here, criminal defense attorneys, brilliant, brilliant attorneys. Uh, everything was dismissed. Um, whole thing cost me probably about 13 grand in legal fees, at which point, you know, but the, the, uh, the arrest was sealed. Everything was thrown out. Basically never happened. So now, um, I went to G2E last year. Yes. As, and I was reporting for CDC gaming reports. We yes. were sitting next to each other, I believe. Well, yes. So <laughs> I there was one of the um, seminars that I was there to write about was on cheating in casinos. I think the title was Current Cheats, Scams, and Frauds. Yes. And so I'm seated there and... Nick comes in, he comes up to the table, hey, how you doing? We're talking, he goes, you're not going to believe what happened to me. And he tells me this story about how he got arrested for this cheating, for this stupid clicker, right? And now the seminar starts, and one of the first things that comes up on the screen, the gaming guy says, now here's a cheat we caught this year. And Nick goes, oh, my God, that's me. And there's a picture of him. And they have a video, close, video, video, and they have a close up picture of this stupid clicker. But and like this is the cheating device he had. It was a stock photo of a clicker. Yes. And the video, did they did you see me doing anything? No, the video of you at the blackjack table, your hand, one of your hands was, you, you know, picking up the cards and the other hand was under the table so you could not see him i wasn't doing anything right yeah he was just playing blackjack the only the only but but what's weird is when this happened the charges had already completely been dropped but they were talking about him as if they had busted public enemy number one the mastermind cheater with the bus clicker did you change seats at this point because you didn't want (laughs) the funny thing is i went up and talked to the guy for 15 minutes after it and the guy didn't even recognize me yeah and and it was uh, this is this is did he use your name in the presentation no no, he didn't. That would have been uh, grounds for uh, getting uh, Mr. Nassessian involved. Well, Mr. Nassessian is involved, and Mr. Dr. Nick is actually pursuing litigation against the Nevada Gaming Board, Reed, uh, Reed uh, the American Gaming Association, just a whole slew of people. Reed Valley Ranch, I would assume. Uh, well, well, we, that, well, we don't the, know. The Reed, that's the G2E. So. Yeah, that's who. That, those are the people who operate G2E. Right. But the Green Valley Ranch incident is different. Yes, this is a defamation. But, but what we're going for is, depending on, obviously, Bob, you know, during this, the discovery process, if we, um, if we, during the discovery process, if we find out that uh, the casino wrote something down saying he was arrested for cheating, or it should have been alleged cheating, and they, they did report it to, excuse me, the Griffin book. And biometrics, I'm assuming as well, because I was playing a slot machine at Excalibur, and just waiting, just check testing out a new slot machine uh, that came out, and uh, to write one of my articles, and I just happened to hit a taxable. So you know, I give them my ID at the Excalibur, and they said you're no longer. When after you give them your the ID, and they they fill out the paperwork and give you the, the the stuff, they told me I was no longer allowed to play any gaming activity. In the casino, they didn't ban me from the property, but they just said no more casino gaming, which I can only assume because the information was put in Griffin that I was a cheater. So that was a problem for me, and that's. So are you suing them as well? I'm suing everybody. Yeah. <laughs> same response of when Groshing, who when Groshing went to Bob, who do we sue? We know when he was in same Bob said the same answer. We sue everybody, anybody and everybody we can. So far, I haven't gotten papers, so if he sued me, I just don't know yeah, about it. Yeah. They're coming. <laughs> no, but yeah, it was a That very... may affect whether or not I'm on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see about that. Um, uh, so, yeah, it was a very interesting experience. Uh, one I, did not, I do not wish to prolong or repeat, but definitely um, made you appreciate things. As you got out, and just to say okay, and then, and I was paranoid for, for those two and a half, three months between the time of the arrest till the time I, I was, you know, basically the charges were dismissed, 
because, you know, every time I see a cop car, oh, my God, it's like you don't want to go back. You know, sometimes you have nightmares and about that. And uh, you had Dr. Alan Schoonmaker on several weeks ago, who's a Ph.D. psychologist, and he's a very good friend of mine. And uh, he helped me work out some things with that issue because he does have the it's like, there's, a, there's there's a psychological component that it affects you. Sure. And like PTSD. Uh, yeah, to some extent. Yeah. I mean, it's not like you're in war or anything, but it does have a it does cause an impact on your life and you know it's perfectly natural he said that have it but but as time goes by things do subside and you know it's like okay now 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 it's time to play offense as james groshin put it you know say we we defended and we we got the way we wanted so now let's see what, what do you guys have to do you know because you, you can't go call somebody a criminal and and, and do you not. think that i mean <laughs> you were playing blackjack and losing do you think it was because they recognized that you were counting cards? No, not at all. So you think this would have happened to a total civilian? Well, this it's possible, but the during the police report that I that I got as part of discovery, they said um, it says right in the report the dealer saw nothing, the camera saw nothing, the pit boss saw nothing, but their whole case was predicated on a unidentifiable individual who said something to a to a pit boss now they could neither identify this player or produce him so in effect a fourth amendment violation i could not face my accuser so it was a constitutionality agreement argument there wait so it was a player that said, said something to a pit boss yes that said that said i had something in my hand which was a set of keys attached to this counter now it's interestingly enough because in the report they say that typically they say um card counting works by adding and subtracting you know numbers right so with and a dividing uh, yeah and dividing so how do you subtract from something that only goes a unilateral one direction <laughs> well you have another clicker that goes the other way <laughs> and then you you add the two together <laughs> yeah and it and it's a vir- the other one is a virtual clicker, though. <laughs> I don't know. The, the, the whole incident was was very I, just confusing to me. And I was sitting there in my cell working out the math and checking out, you know, okay, how could I do this? Thinking, like, nah, I can't, can't possibly. So I, I said, I'm going to beat this. There's no way. Now, I have an MBA and from an Ivy League school. Now, people that sometimes go to jail in that profession, but usually it's for white-collar crimes. But, and for a lot more money. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. They, they, usually you don't lose money and go to jail. <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, let's talk about um, – yeah, let's let's talk about blackjack for a minute. Let's sure. go back to – Let's not talk about blackjack. Okay. We're, this is a good time for a commercial. We, we okay. finished up with this subject. So we're going to have a commercial, and then we're going to come back and talk about um, his MIT blackjack team experiences, his uh, – being an MD and his uh, and this hot Aussie chick that he goes around podcasting with. We'll be right back. The South Point has more than 10,000 gains returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. We've been talking about the August promotions for a while. And since August is over, let's talk about September. There's going to be two separate promotions going on in September. First, there's the $600,000 Money Madness. Promotion where there are two casino-wide progressives going at the same time. The big one is hit between 10000 and 25000 And if you're playing when somebody else hits it, you get $25 in free play. And then a new one starts at 10000 The smaller one goes off between 1000 and 2500 and hits about three times a day. You are eligible for both of these progressives so long as your card is in and you've played at least $1 in the past 60 seconds. The second monthly promotion is for Bottles of Moonshine. Played 500 points per week, Saturday through Sunday. Uh, Well, how about Sunday through Saturday? And earn one bottle of City Lights Shine. Max two bottles per week with your choice of four different flavors. These bottles are specially labeled to commemorate the inaugural South Point 400 NASCAR race, which will be held on September 16th the last class in the free video poker series is tuesday september 4th and it's called secrets of a video poker winner 
The class is about the winning process and is understandable to those who are newcomers to intelligent gambling, as well as those who are more experienced and wish some of the fine points. At videopoker.com, it's the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. The game of the week is Wheel Poker. This is six coins per line game where you get to spin a wheel when you end up with a natural four of a kind. The average wheel spin is worth 428 coins. The correct strategy isn't hard to work out. If you were playing a game where the quads were worth 250, 400, and 800, you add 428 to each of them to get 678, 828, and 1228 respectively, and then you work out the strategy. The hands that change in value aren't that many. You check out things such as low pair versus four card straights, two pair versus um, dumping a lower pair, and whether it's smart to keep kickers on three of a kinds on triple double bonus. There are a few other hands to look at, but not many. Okay, Dr. Nick, you tell us about your experience with the MIT blackjack team. Well, first of all, everything you see in the movies and the books is completely inaccurate. Yeah, John, John, Chang, John, John, John Chang said that half the stuff in the book was right. Was, was right. And in the movie, threw out that other half. Yeah, right. Threw out that half. Other than when they did do verbal clues, such as if they... Uh, you mean if, signals for passing si the count? Yeah, if you, did, if you had a count of eight... You did have a, a verbal clue for that, and so the movie sort of got that one right. But mm -hmm. um, but he said we uh, did not hang out in uh, in strip bars. <laughs> I have been in Vegas for four years, um, between Vegas and Chicago. Uh, I have a home here, and back and forth for the last twenty years, and I have only been into a strip club once. And it was a platinum strip club on Flamingo, which is closed. And believe me, it's not a good experience. But we never went into strip club. I, I did it anyway. Uh, I, actually, it's funny. I almost bought that club at one point, like 35 <laughs> years ago. Back then, it was called the Tender Trap. And uh, for a while, it was for a long time, it was a jazz club. And then they turned it into a strip club and it was really a bad strip club. <laughs> it was, it was, you're yeah. looking at you're looking up at bad i mean that's yeah, how not, terrible it not was pretty but um i yeah, actually so, don't know what it takes to be a bad strip club is this like 80 year old ladies in there who uh, let's just say this instead of dollars you throw coins yeah uh-huh so uh they take off their clothes and you say put them back on yes that's yeah. what it means well, to it's be very bad. very low lighting <laughs> right but they had the greatest bartender. Anyway, well, let, we're off the subject. Let's go back to how did you get involved with the MIT team? How did you start playing blackjack? Um, I. Well, it goes back. Uh, you, I would say, probably fifteen or sixteen. When I was, it was spring break, and I was in high school. And it was a gloomy day in Chicago, raining, and I'm, I'm flipping through the channels. You know, half zombified as tv does and all of a sudden i see this history channel think about las vegas and uh you know the lights the pretty girls and and then you know so i'm watching it and then they bring on ed thorpe and he talks about what he did and you know his uh how, how you know how he changed everything basically changed everything i mean basically as he put it he's the the he dropped the pebble in the ocean that started a tidal wave and literally that's what he did yes and um, and it was one of my great honors to meet him at the twenty first blackjack ball. Yes. And um, I he I I interviewed him for an article once, and then I um, I did a review on his book, and he sent me the book, and I read it. And they liked the review on so much the the, the Penguin Press, I believe it was, that they actually put my quote on the back of the book. Was just I mean, so him and I are forever connected, and he's just. Probably the most humble guy you've ever met in your entire life. Yes, we we've he's been on the show. Uh, both Richard and I enjoy him. Wish we could spend more time with him. Actually, yes, and and he's a Chicago boy too. So of course, when I met him, nobody's I had to, perfect. <laughs> I had to give him a World Champion Chicago Cubs hat. 
So and he and he wore it, you know, proudly, and and that's just, so so I, I that's how it all started for me, and I, I went looking around for this book, Beat the Dealer. Couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. Finally, I found a place <clears throat> in um, the secondhand bookstore in you know, City of Chicago, and I went in there, and you know, my it was right by my aunt's house. We used to go to my aunt's house all the time, um, once a week, with my mom and I. And um, I got it, and you know, great, thank you, and this, that, and the other. And I read it, and I read it again, and then, then I then I went into the Revere's book, and then um, you know, uh, I didn't have the math to understand Griffin's book, but I did read it, and not until college did I fully understand what was going on there. So, um, and then Stanford Wong actually had some good stuff. And so I, I just started off slowly and then he had some good stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's groundbreaking in his own right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. That, that, is, that is not his name, though. Stanford Wong is not no. his name. Yeah. But, that is... but so I, I actually got his number and just, and, you know, just studied the game and, and, and made the first trip when I was 21 to play. And that's how it all began for me. And then, um, you know, you start to develop your own things and get more and more. But during that 21st Blackjack Ball, even though when I was 16, 17, when I finally got that book, I still have that book. And Ed Thorpe actually signed that book for me. So it was a, I had the first the first edition, you know, it only took me, you know, 25 years to get it signed by him. Or and But, yeah, it's, it's sitting there on my shelf. It's a prized collection, prized possession of mine. Then you got it used because at the ball it was the fiftieth anniversary of that book. Yes, it was the original one. It actually with the original strategy cards in it when in the back. Yeah, I have the same copy. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. And actually, his daughter was with him when I ha- asked him to sign it. She's yeah. like, "Is that a first edition?" Yeah. Well, mine was too because I guess his third kid wasn't born yet because <laughs> it only said to Vivian, my wife, and his two daughters. Yeah. Now, coincidentally, uh, Thorpe has th- uh, triplet grandchildren, and they are all MIT students. Huh. So let's get back to yep. MIT. Yep. Right. So right. how did you end up playing with those uh, guys? I met some guys, um, and you know, um, they were said, you you were in school in Boston at the time? No, I was in Chicago. I was doing some, you know, doing back in Chicago. But I visited some people in Boston, and I just you know, coincidentally they were hanging around the MIT campus, and you know, um, no, I wasn't on the. I wasn't on the team to John Chang. I was on a subs- uh, secondary team after that. Um, you know, Simeon Dukash was involved, um, and uh, Brett Knowlton, who's a good friend of mine too. Um, he, I don't think he was in the book, but um, yeah, these are secondary. These are after the first team, the mate, the, the second, the, the students of that team, because the MIT team has existed in one form or another for. 55, 60 years. I don't know if they're they're running at all, but Yeah, now. no, I mean, and John has mentioned there were lots of different factions and yeah. people broke, up, broke off and a lot yeah. of different teams. A derivative team, I guess, would be the best. Ended up being called the MIT team. Yeah, so. but the main ones were John, the one John Tate, the strategic investment. So I, yeah, I just met and they says, oh, you should go and check these guys out. So I looked into it and and <coughs> I mentioned some things to them and, um, and yeah, it's just one thing led to another and, uh, you know, I just start studying, and then you know, with the internet, you make Yahoo groups and things like that. And so, um, at that point, how big was the group? Uh, was it a big well, player call-in <coughs> approach? And there was about it was a big player call-in approach, and you know, um, rather than go with them, I actually secured funding of my own, um, about fifty thousand from a guy on the I knew in Boston, and uh, we made probably about. Over the course of you know twelve or fifteen trips, I'd say we made about thirty five, forty thousand dollars. And you know, after that, we all kind of broke and went our own ways. And then I met a guy in Chicago, and we raised about one hundred fifty thousand, and um, you know, did the same thing and worked uh, well for several years um, until he was arrested for insider art fraud or something like that, <laughs> something like that. But I, I, I hadn't been with him for, you know, a while because I was you know, doing my medical school thing. And and um, he was arrested for art fraud and he did four or five years in some, you know, country club somewhere in, uh, in Texas or in Illinois. I'm not sure which, but but yeah. And then kind of I raised my own money and um, and just been playing solo by myself. Uh developing some systems um some blackjack all over the country and some other more particular systems that i mentioned to you that i won't get into 
But so yeah. currently, do you travel much, or do you mostly yeah, play I here travel. in Vegas? I travel. All over the country, doing a variety of things. Um, blackjack is tough in Vegas, because it's, it's, you know, the st- stakes are, you know, they, they, get, they freak out when you put a couple hundred dollars out there. Yeah, and, and the communication in Las Vegas is really bad. So Meaning really good. Well, I mean, good for them, but bad for the player. I right. mean, the communication, once somebody identifies you as a card counter, your name gets disseminated all over town. So, right. Your name and, yeah, and, you know, what your mannerism and what you do and how you look and how you walk and how you talk. So it's important to, to come up with methodologies to deter them from that. And, you know, you play the game as the rules are written. If they want to play that way, then you have to go about, you know, securing other players' cards any way possible. Um, some mischievous, some s- standard, you know, but morally ambiguous, I think, would be a better term. So that's what you got to go and do. Uh, th- that's never been my approach. I I have always just played as a refusal. So, uh, right. um, uh, you but, mentioned in but one, but that's of, getting harder to do. Yeah, to exactly. As a refusal. You're, you mentioned. Um, He's asking me this question. Yes. You mentioned earlier in the the, the points, and you know you need a player's card. Yeah, you need a player's card because that's how they track your play, and that's how you get. You know, you can if you lose a couple grand, um, they're not going to go and give you a. They'll they'll, they'll give you a hundred and fifty dollar comp dinner or at Giada's or at uh, Ruth Chris or at you know some you know five star restaurant. But if you don't have that, they don't know who you are. So yeah, it's important to to do that. Again, that's not Richard's approach. Now, you're talking blackjack. Yeah. R- Richard, apparently, uh, let me paraphrase what I've learned from you, and you tell me how bad it is, is you do get comps, but if they finally decide you're too good, now they have your name, and it's real easy. It's a whole lot easier to say Richard Munchkin is a guy. Then there's this guy with this beard and glasses and baseball hat. hat yeah. and, uh, so, um, so there's downsides to that too. If you're using it as identification in non-slot department, uh, I, I should say on the other hand, though, it at the levels you're talking about betting, maybe the comps are enough that that is considered part of your uh, uh, EV. Um, you know, if you get to a level where you're betting more than that, I can pay for my own dinner at right. Giada and, and right, right. would prefer the extra anonymity. Well, yes. You know, what you said and what Bob said, they have a, they have your name. Well, they don't have your name. They may necessarily have a name. Well, if you're going with players' cards and other names, then yes, that's that's right. true. So, right. But that can, that can get you in a whole different kettle of fish. You know, yes. that, that's another... You can have another... Meeting with Bob Nersessian yeah. to get well, you out of Another him. RFB at the uh, county yeah. jail. Not that I'm saying that's illegal, because if it's an alias ID, we had RX Gamble on um, the last couple of shows, and you know she pointed out an alias ID is not illegal as long as it's not a Nevada driver's license that's been a, a fake Nevada driver's license. But that doesn't mean that you may not end up in jail, and yes, you'll end up Oh, well, there, the there, there, there but, are risks, but it's going to cost you money, you know, obviously. Yeah. And I yeah. think John Chang's wife was, she got busted with something like 80 IDs or something. I don't think it was anywhere near that. I, I think it was, it was several. five or six or really? something. I thought but, it was a lot more. But she also more. went to jail. I mean, well. So, you know, I mean, and, and I have to say this about the lawsuits. Every person I know that has gone through one of these lawsuits at the end of it all has said, it wasn't worth it. It would have been much better if it had never happened. Yeah, even if they got twenty or fifty or a hundred thousand thousand dollars, they well, go. So, is, this... I mean, it's going to take years, you know, literally years, and a lot of your time and effort and. You well, know. this is this was my this is my second tangle with litigation. I've actually uh, gone up against Caesars before, and Bob took the case before, and we we made. Quite a bit of money on that. Oh, what was the other one? Uh, breach of innkeeper's duty. I was playing at uh, Caesar's property, and they busted into my room and told me to get out at you know at like three in the morning or something. Wow! And I'm um, like, <laughs> again, I said, okay, are you sure about this? Because you guys are all going to be fired. And you know they were very you know tough. Oh, get out right now! So I was like, okay. And sure enough, when we filed litigation and went to depose them, well, we don't know where these people are at. They're, they're no longer working for Caesars. What wow. a surprise. Wow. Yeah, Did yes. you hunt them down? 
Uh, the Caesars ultimately settled out of court. Yeah, and but was it, there it, a uh, uh, non-disclosure? It, yes, there was. Yeah. Uh-huh. See, but it was. If I was had one of these cases, that is a no deal for well, me. Are you Not sure? Be able to talk about that. That. Are you sure? Well, if you it's could, twenty thousand settlement, or we'll give you three hundred if you sign the NDA. Are you yeah, sure? They never go that. <laughs> they never. You know what happens is they always ask. This is the deal, but it's an NDA. And yeah. Other than James Grosjean, who's like, no. <laughs> Grosjean no. actually went to trial. Yeah. And he destroyed him. Yeah. And actually, you know, Bob and Thea, I don't forget Thea. Thea is a sharp, sharp Bob woman. Bob says Thea is the brains of the operation. But know? I call Bob a bulldog. That's all. That's fair. And you know, he, 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 uh, I got worried because he kind of had a cardiac event during my case. I'm like, Bob, you can't be doing this. And now the guy wants to be a school teacher in Nevada. I'm like, are you nuts? We need you, Bob. So, but Bob's got this case and uh, he's taking it. And, um, yeah, and, you know, I'm, he's fairly optimistic about it. But it, like, like Bob says, it, or Bob Dancer says, it takes, uh, it takes a while. I think my, my, my litigation with Caesars lasted about two years, and I expect this one to be about the same. Yeah. Now, um, you mentioned uh, medical school. I, I just have to ask, because you went through medical school and surgical residency, right? I did some training in surgical residency, yes. And, and that's a lot of time and effort, and then you decided not you didn't want to be a doctor? Or? Uh, well, you'll always be a doctor. I mean, what's in your head makes you a doctor. Well, um, do you have a license that says you're a doctor? Yes. Okay. So, but I'm, you decided you didn't want to practice well, well, medicine. Well, I mean, that's not uncommon. Um, oh yeah. Because I think about a third of my graduating class isn't practicing medicine anymore. I knew that was true with lawyers. I didn't know it was yeah, true li- with doctors. Li- liability is pretty high. Um, Malpractice is through the roof, um, and a lot of people it's just it's not worth it for them, and and um, it's. They're, well, they're if you better, don't enjoy better, it, they're, they're, then... they're, well, it's not that I didn't enjoy. It. I mean, but half your half your time is fighting with insurance companies, and the other half is trying to get the right procedure done. And it's just there are easier ways to make money, and um, it's just uh, what I'm trying to say is, you know, I've got uh, the, the MD is not the only thing. I mean, I do have an MBA, and I do have you know, some graduate work in physics as well. But uh, I do some consulting work. I develop some interesting casino games that that, that, that are out there. Um, yeah, it seems and, clear you have more passion in that area. Well, gaming then. mathematics is what I like, and nobody dies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, teaching, I do some teaching. I am working on some medical uh, website stuff. Um, I have two current projects. I own a women's magazine, women's poker player magazine called Women's Poker World which is up and running, and I'm getting ready to launch a new website called Casino Exploits, which is just a series of articles and um, and uh, the big thing is a platform where, where people and APs can communicate with one each other without fear of uh, you know, penetration by the casino authorities. So it, it's it doesn't have it's level one is free, uh, two, three, and four are all paid for, and then there's a level five, which is by invite only, um, which is like uh, higher end APs, like people who attend the blackjack ball, like Richard and Bob and myself, and James and some other people as well that that have some you know interesting insights and in what to put out there. All right. Now, um, well, I was just gonna say you now you also have a podcast. Yeah. So the podcast is called Doctor Nick and the Hot. Aussie chick. It just seems to me this ought to be a video show if the title is about the hot Aussie chick. Well, I, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> I tend to, uh, I like to avoid uh, any type of. Uh, well, you could visual. just put the camera on her the whole time. I could. Um, or her, a, it's paper bag over your head, <laughs> or a surgical mask. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, uh, it's we started it god probably in a few months ago i'd say probably february or march and it's the two of us uh the hot aussie chick is danielle banham adams uh from australia she was a world-class female poker player online um and she does stuff for poker news as well she's a video presenter for poker news and we just talk about a variety of things of blackjack and poker and 
bringing the I, two together. Some of it didn't seem to be about gambling at all. I uh, one of the episodes I was listening to. Uh, well, we did about um, poker psychology, uh, World Series of Poker, what's going on. Um, we did do a show regarding the. Um, I, I'm not sure what show you're speaking of, but we did do a show about uh, when some new information came about about the gam about the Las Vegas gambler. Or the Las Vegas shooting. I'm sorry, the video poker, uh -huh. and we we talked about that a little bit, um, but then we did we tied it back into and Bob can attest to this about how they said this this guy was like the biggest video poker player in the world. And I'm like, no, that's not the case at all, my friend. <laughs> it's like they were just they were trying to blow it up to sensationalize it. Like we, as we all know, and uh, you were in Hollywood for years. They tend to you know there's uh, artistic license. Yeah, the, the the media definitely didn't understand the video poker world. And, yes, and, and it's like, that was apparent in every article where they discussed it. Anthony Curtis was on CNN, and they 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 threw all this stuff at him. He's like, no, no, <laughs> not even close, not even close. Yeah, of course, yeah, you know, video poker schlubs go around, and you know, they dress like that, and that's what they do. Yeah, I, I think he just called you a schlub, Bob. <laughs> I, I don't know if, if I um, I don't know if I've told it on the air about. When the FBI called me about this, about this case, but it was, uh, shall we say, uncomfortable. Yeah. All right. Really, they called you. Huh? Now is your, yes, uh, they went around. They thought video poker was uh, a key part of this. They weren't sure, and so they asked ev all all players, "Do you know anybody who plays high stakes video poker and might know this guy?" Well, I teach classes. I'm pretty well known. So a number of people said, well, call Bob Dancer. So they called Bob Dancer. And when the FBI calls, um, kind of it's a good idea to answer the questions. So um, Probably not, but, but, uh, but yeah. But this wasn't something that I felt I needed an attorney for this. I, had, I had, right. did yeah. not know the I never met the guy. I did not know his name before the, seeing the news reports. So it was, uh, so I handled it. Uh, without representation, and, it, and there was no follow up to it. Yeah, and I'm surprised. I mean, Anthony, Anthony, I think Anthony Curtis, this guy was on Anthony Curtis's mailing list, and they never got in touch. They never got in touch with him. Yeah, I mean, he gets a newsletter. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. There's a lot of strange things, but yeah. So we we talk about a variety of topics, but uh, they tie into some respect gaming in one form or another. So is it done regularly or irregularly, and uh, so where do you find them? <laughs> we we try to do them semi-regular, at least once every couple of weeks. We're trying to get it where we want to do once a week, and they are on um, – you can find them on Gambling with the Edge, the Las Vegas Advisor, Gambling with the Edge. Uh, Gamblingwithanedge.com. Yeah, well, here, and then there's also a couple um, other sites that we're going to put them on. Uh, one is on – it's on right now, uh, Casino Meister. Dot com, which is in Germany, uh, Brian Bailey's site, and um, the Pog will be putting it up shortly uh, in, as uh, also in Europe and Scotland specifically. So they all pretty high traffic sites. Um, I guarantee you, they're 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 tuning in just for for her, not for me. Well, again, you need to put a bag over your head and, and make a video out of it. <laughs> so, you know, if I was to be really bad, I could say, boy, that sounds a familiar for my ex-girlfriend used to say. Uh -huh. well, <laughs> or just shoot it over your shoulder. We just see the back of your head and yeah. keep it on her. Yeah, definitely. I thought about doing that for this show. With Bob or with you? <laughs> oh, not seeing me. <laughs> just seeing Bob okay. and the guest. And the yeah, guest. Richard has no... Uh, compunction whatsoever about posting my picture up there <laughs> right. with the guest but <laughs> right. his picture if and whenever we have somebody from surveillance as a guest on our show for some reason richard's always busy that day and has to phone in yeah uh, you know it's funny because somebody said oh you know i'm surprised your picture is on the you know the facebook page for for gambling with an edge and i was like no it's not and i went and it was ed miller <laughs> You so, look nothing like Ed well, Miller. Well, hey, I, I, get, I think maybe they just assumed that that, that was me. I don't know. But, uh, hey, yeah. if people think I'm Ed Miller, that's fine with me. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, good. Then, since you're Ed Miller, can you tell us more about your adventures when you're on the TV show um, Queer Eye and the Straight Guy? Was that – was it was a uh, – how did 
Because you dress like a schlub, and these are, are a bunch of uh, gay guys who are going to teach you how to dress. It was what oh, the that's premise right. he of was that. On that show, he right? was. Yeah. Huh. He was really. And uh, so he's uh, so he dressed better for a while, I guess. Um, All right. Ed's got a heart of gold from he's got some adopted kids and really 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 sharp guy too any any one of his books uh are great uh, the course is really good all right so we've been talking to dr nick we thank you very much for your time we uh if once your case gets settled come back and talk to us again and uh thank you very much thank you guys have a great day thank you richard go out and hit royal flush everybody good day